Didn't think I'd be glad to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that. For your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. As far as piano goes, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. Speaking of the science of life, have you got those cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracken? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, by the way, Lane, I saw from your books that on last Thursday, when Lord Shoreman and Mr. Worthing dined with us, that eight bottles of champagne as marked are being then consumed. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably end up drinking the champagne? I asked merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens, is marriage so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a pleasant state, sir. I have very little experience up to the present. I've only been married once, and this was in consequence to a misunderstanding between myself and the young person. <laughs> I don't think I'm much interested in your personal life, mate. <laughs> no, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I rarely think of it myself. <laughs> very natural, I'm sure. That will do, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> They seem to me as a class to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Uncertainty. If I'm ever to be married, I'll certainly try very hard to forget the fact. <laughs> I've no doubt about that, dear Auntie. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories were so curiously constituted. There's no use speculating on that subject. Divorces were made in heaven. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> <sighs> but, my dear fellow, I don't think that there's a very good likelihood that you will be married to women. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, women don't marry the men they flirt with. Women don't think it's right. Oh, that's nonsense. It isn't. It's a great truth. It explains the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees all over the place. And in the second place, I don't give my consent. <laughs> Your consent? <laughs> Gwendolyn is my first cousin, my dear fellow. And before I allow you to marry her, you'll have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? What do you mean? What do you mean, Auntie, about Cecily? I, I don't know anyone in the name of Cecily. Bring me the cigarette case Mr. Worthing left last time he died here. Yes, sir. <laughs> what do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you would let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. 
That's very new. It's a real large reward. And I wish you would, but it's going to be more than usually hard up. But there's no offering, there's no use in offering a large reward now that the thing is found. Well, I must say, I think that's rather mean if you want it. But, now that I read the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't really yours after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what's written inside. It's a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. I would simply absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of that fact, but I don't propose to discuss modern culture. This isn't the sort of thing one should talk about in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. <laughs> but this isn't your cigarette case. <laughs> <laughs> this cigarette case was a present from someone of the name... Cecily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes, charming old lady she is too. Lives at Tumber 12. Just give it back to me, aren't you? Yes, but why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tumber 12? From Little Cecily with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. <laughs> but surely in the matter, an aunt may be able to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. Now that's absurd. Now for heaven's sake, excuse me, have my cigarette case. But why does your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily, with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. There's no objection, I admit, in an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size, would call her own nephew her uncle, I simply can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all, it's Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. But you've always told me it was Ernest. I've introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answered the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. <laughs> You're the most earnest looking person I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> it's simply absurd you're saying your name is Ernest. It's on your cards. Here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B for the Albany. I'll keep this as proof that your name is Ernest <laughs> if you try to deny it to me or to Gwendolyn or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country, and my and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that doesn't explain why your small aunt calls you her uncle. Come now, little boy, you much better have the thing out of it. My dear aunt, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist. It's a very vulgar thing to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a, a false impression. That's exactly what dentists always do. Now, come on, tell me the whole thing. I might, might add that I've always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret bunderist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Bunderist? What on earth do you mean by bunderist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you tell me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now, produce your explanation. My dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly, old. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle for motives of respect which you could not possibly appreciate, resides in my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is this place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You're not going to be invited. I may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. Well, I suspected that much. I've bummed all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on, why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear boy, I don't know whether you'll be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt the very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to be conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness, I've always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest who gets into the most dreadful scrapes and lives at the Albany. That, my dear fellow, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is never pure and rarely simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. <laughs> well, that wouldn't at all be a bad thing. Literary criticism isn't your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. Much better to leave that to people who haven't been to university. They do it so well in the daily papers. <laughs> what you really are is a bunburyist. I've always suspected you of being a bunburyist, and I was quite right about it. You're one of the most advanced bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You've invented a very useful younger brother named Ernest in order that you may go up to town whenever you like. I have invented a permanent invalid named Bunbury so that I may be able to go visit the country whenever I choose. 
Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinarily bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight. For really, I've been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I'm not to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You're absurdly careless about sending out invitations. <laughs> it's very foolish. Nothing annoys someone so much as not receiving invitations. Well, you'd much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I have no intention of doing anything of the kind. In the first place, I dine there on Monday, and once a week is more than enough to dine with one's own relations. And in the second place, whenever I do dine there, I'm treated as a member of a family, and either sent down with no woman at all, or with two. And in the third place, I know perfectly well who she'll sit me next to tonight, Mary Farquhar, who always insists on flirting with her own husband from across the dinner table. <laughs> It isn't very pleasant. <laughs> Indeed, it isn't even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the rise these days. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It just looks bad. It's like washing one's own clean linens in public. Besides, now that I know you're a Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk with you about Bunbury. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If one of them accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. <laughs> Indeed, I think I'll get rid of him anyway. Cecily has become a little bit too much interest in him. It's rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly suggest you do the same with your Mr. With your invalid friend who has the absurd name. <laughs> Nothing will induce me to part with dear Bunbury. And indeed, if you are to get married, which I find particularly problematic, you'll be very glad to know Bunbury. Any man who marries without knowing Bunbury will have a very tedious time of it. That's nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like one of them, and she's the only girl I ever saw in my life who I married, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. <laughs> what you seem to fail to realize is that in marriage, three is company and two is none. <laughs> that, my dear young friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and the happy English household has proven half the time. No, for heaven's sakes, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. <laughs> That'll be out of gusto. Only creditors and relations were in that Wagnerian manner. If I get her out of the way for ten minutes, so that you might have an opportunity to propose to Gwen, may I dine with you at Willis's tonight? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who aren't serious about it. <laughs> it's so very shallow. <laughs> I'm feeling very well to it. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear me, you are smart. I am always smart. And we're not, Mr. Worthy. You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I do hope I am not that. To be perfect, you leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. I'm so sorry we're late, Admiral, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbour. I haven't been there since your poor husband's death. I've never seen a woman so old. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now we'll have a cup of tea and some of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Of course, I'll just that. Gwendolyn, why don't you come and sit here? Thanks, Mama. <laughs> I can't tell where I am. Good heavens, Lane! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Oh yes, Bunbury's a dreadful invalid. <laughs> well, I must say, Antoine, that I think it is high time that this Mr. Bunbury decides whether he's going to live or to die. This shilly shallying with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health. <coughs> is a primary duty in life. <laughs> I'm always telling this to your quam, who doesn't take much notice as far as any proof that this ailment goes. I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunder who brung me, not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I require you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season, when practically everyone has said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. <laughs> I'll speak to Bunbury Aunt Augusta, but I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. The music, of course, is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen, but if one plays bad music, people don't talk. I'll be happy to run over the program with you if you'll step into the next room for a moment with me. Thank you, Algernon. That is so very good. I'm sure the program will be delightful after, after a few exaggerations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they are improper and either laugh, which is vulgar, or look shocked, which is worse. German. Now, German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and I believe is indeed so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Well, certainly, Mama. <laughs> Charming day, said Miss Fairfax. Pray don't speak to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever anybody talks to me about the weather, I always feel certain they mean something else, and that makes me nervous. <laughs> well, I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to be able to take advantage of this opportunity, too. I do wish you would. Mama has a way of coming suddenly back into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any girl I've ever met since I met you. <laughs> <laughs> I am quite well aware of that fact, and do wish that at least in public you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideas, and my ideal has always been to love a man of the name of Ernest. <laughs> There's something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. From the moment Algernon mentioned he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. Do you really love me, Mother? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't really mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. <laughs> yes, I, I know it. <laughs> but, but supposing it was something else, do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? That is clearly a metaphysical speculation, and like most metaphysical speculations, has absolutely no reference at all to the facts of life as we know them. <laughs> well, to be quite frankly, darling, I, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I, I don't think it suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has music of its own. It produces vibrations. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be quite frankly, darling, I think it's much nicer names. Uh, Jack, for instance, is a charming name. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Jack has little music at all that does not thrill. I've known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than unusually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John. And I pity any woman married to a man called John. She would never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. No, the only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, well, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There's no time to lose. Married, <laughs> Mr. Wedding! But yes, I love you, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you're not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you. But you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? Now would be a favorable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Whirling, I think it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Gwendolyn. Yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? <laughs> well, you know what I've got to say. Yes, but you don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long you have been about it. 
I'm afraid you've had very little experience in how to propose. My own one. I've never loved anyone in the world but you. I know that, but men often propose for practice. <laughs> I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. <laughs> what wonderful eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite good. I hope you will always look at me the way you look at me now, especially when there are other people present. <laughs> Rise, sir, from that semi common posture. It is most indecorous. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is not the place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing is not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? Mr. Worthing and I are engaged to be married, Mama. Pardon me. You are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is not a matter that she could be allowed for de to decide for herself. And now I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthy. And while I'm making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. That's Mama. <laughs> <laughs> Gwendolyn, the carriage! <laughs> you can take a seat, Mr. Worthy. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bound to tell you that you are not my list of eligible young men. Although I do share the same as the dear Duchess of Bolton, we work together in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. <laughs> How old are you? Twenty-nine. That is a very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man to be married should either know everything or nothing. Which do you know? I... I know nothing, Lady Rackle. I am pleased to hear it. <laughs> I don't believe anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. However, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. <laughs> if it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. <laughs> what is your income? About 700,000 a year. In land or investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted of one after one's death? Land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It merely gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all they can say about land. I have a country house for some land, of course, attached to it. About 1,500 acres, I believe, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poets are the only ones who can make anything out of it. <laughs> a country house? <laughs> How many bedrooms? Well, that matter will be sorted out later. I hope you have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with unspoiled nature like Wendelin can hardly be expected to reside in the country. I own a house in Belvedere Square, which is let by the year to the Lady Bloxham. I can get it back whenever I like at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belvedere Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I knew there was something! However, that can easily be altered. <laughs> Do you mean the fashion or the facade? Both if necessary, I presume. Now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I lost both my parents. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, to lose one parent may be regarded as misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your father? He was evidently a man of summer. Was he born in what the radical papers call the Purple of Commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. You see, Lady Bracknell, I, I said I lost both my parents, but it would be much nearer to the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am, but you see, well, well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an older gentleman of a very kindly and charitable disposition, found me and gave him the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first class ticket for Worthing in his pocket that day. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It's a seaside resort. And where did this gentleman with a first class ticket to a seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag! Yes, Lady Bracknell. 
I was found in a handbag. A somewhat large, black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Hardy find you in this ordinary handbag? In the cloak room at Victoria Station. It was given, him, it was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloak room at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthy, and I must tell you, I feel somewhat bewildered by what you've just told me. <coughs> <coughs> to be born, or to anything bred in a handbag, whether it had tentacles or not, seems to me to display contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that remind me of the worst, decent, worst excesses of the French Revolution. <laughs> I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, and probably has indeed been used for that purpose before now, and can hardly serve in a, as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. Well then, when I, may I ask you what you advise me to do? I need hardly say I'd do anything to ensure one of its happiness. I would advise you to try to find, acquire some relations as soon as possible and to make a definite effort to acquire one parent to be the sex before the season is quite over. <laughs> well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It's in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Brackle. Me, sir? What is it to do with me? You could hardly imagine that Lord Bracknell or I would allow our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom or form a relation with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. <laughs> well, good morning. It's the only thing that makes me put up with them in the first place. <laughs> Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't the remotest knowledge on how to live, nor the slightest instinct on when to die. <laughs> That's nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue, madam, with you. You always want to argue about things. Well, that is what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? <laughs> My dear boy, the truth is the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl like Gwendolyn. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. <laughs> the only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she's pretty, or to someone else if she's plain. That's nonsense. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week I shall have gotten rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy or something like that. People are always dying of apoplexy quite suddenly, aren't they? <laughs> yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. Much better to say a severe chill. And you're sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? Of course it isn't. Well, there it is. My poor brother Ernest was carried off suddenly by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. What about um, Miss Cardi? Didn't you say she was a little too much interested in your dear brother? Won't she feel his loss a great deal? Oh, Cecily's in a silly romantic type. I'm glad to say she has a capital appetite. She takes long walks and pays no attention at all to her status. I should rather like to see this, Cecily. <laughs> I shall take good care you never do. She's excessively pretty and only just 18. Does Gwendolyn know you have an excessively pretty ward who's only just 18? One doesn't blurt these things out to people. <laughs> Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I bet you anything you like that a half hour after they met, they would be calling each other sister. Women only do that once they call each other a lot of other things. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we're going to get a good table at Willis's, we best go and get changed. Do you know it's nearly seven? No, it's always nearly seven. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I'm hungry. I never knew you when you worked. <laughs> 
Well, what shall we do after dinner? Shall we go to the theatre? I know I hate this. Well, let us go to the club. I know, loads of talking. Well, we could trot round to the Empire around ten. I know, I can't bear to stand to look at things. It's so silly. Well, what shall we do? Nothing.
I do not think that I should even wish to acclaim him. I'm not in favour of this modern mania of turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man so so let him reap. <laughs> you must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter all the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and could have possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three volume novels that movie sends us. You must not speak slightingly of the three volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier years. Did you really, Miss Grissom? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I didn't like novels that end happily. They depressed me so much. The good ended happily, and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. Back to your work, child. These speculations are profitless. But I see Dr. Chasuble coming up through the gardens. Dr. Chasuble, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning, Miss Prism? I trust you are well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll through the park with you, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, do you, Miss Prism? I know that, but I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. Cecily, I hope you're not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. Oh, that is strange. Well, I fought enough to be misprisoned pupil. I would hang about her lips. <coughs> I, I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <coughs> <laughs> I suppose Mr. Worthing has not turned from town yet. But you would expect him back till Monday afternoon. Ah, uh, yes, he does like to spend his Sunday in London. Is not one of those who saw Amos enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Egeria and her people any longer. Egeria, my name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical illusion merely, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at even song. I think, dear Doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I find I do have a headache after all, and walk my to it. Pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. You may admit the child from the fall of the group here to some obtuse and social. Even these metallic problems have their merit on that side. <laughs> Ugh, horrid political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid German. <laughs> 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 Ernest Worthing has just been driven over from the station. He's brought his luggage with him. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the old W. Uncle Jack's brother. And did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He seemed very anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Okay. <laughs> Ask Mr. Now that you mention it, I have been very bad in my own small way. I'm not sure you should be so proud of that, but I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you're here at all. Uncle Jack will be back to Monday afternoon. Oh, that is a great disappointment. I'm obliged to go up by the first train Monday morning. I have a business appointment I am anxious to 
Miss. Couldn't you visit anywhere but London? <laughs> no, the appointment's in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to obtain any sense for the beauty of life, but still, I think you'd better wait till Uncle Jack returns. I know he wants to speak to you about your... your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. He's gone up to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties whatsoever. <laughs> I, I don't think you'll require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. <laughs> well, there is dinner on Wednesday night, but you'd have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Well, the accounts I've received of Australia and the next world aren't particularly promising. This world's good enough for me. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm not that. Which is why I'd like you to reform me. You might make it your mission if you don't mind, Cousin Cecil. I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. Oh. Well, do you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. Very well. I will. I'm feeling better already. <laughs> you are looking a little worse. That is because I'm hungry. How thoughtless of me. I forgot that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have a buttonhole first, though? I never have any appetite for that buttonhole first. A marky O'Neill? I prefer a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be quite right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You're the prettiest girl I ever saw. <laughs> Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They're a snare that any sensible young man would like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I can catch a sensible man. I wouldn't know who to talk to him about. <laughs> <laughs> You're not to alone, dear doctor. You should get married. The missing rope, I understand. The woman broke never. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. That is certainly why the primitive church has not lasted up into the present day. And what you do not seem to understand, dear doctor, is that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. Such celibacy means weaker vessels astray. Is a man not equally as attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive, except to his wife. Nor as I've been told, not even to her. <laughs> <laughs> Maturity can always be depended on. Rightness can be trusted. Young men are green. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruit. <laughs> but where was Cecily? Perhaps you followed us to the schools. Mr. Worthing? This is indeed a surprise. We do not expect you back till Monday afternoon. I return sooner than I expected. I hope you're well, Dr. Jospel. My dear Mrs. Worthing, I trust that this garden world does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful deaths and extravagances. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead! Your brother Ernest is dead. <coughs> Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust you will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincerest condolences. You've at least the uh, consolation of knowing you're the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No. He died abroad in Paris, in fact. I received a call last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. It was the cause of death mentioned. A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so let him reap. Oh, charity, Miss Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. <coughs> <laughs> Will the interment take place here? No. He seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in. in. in Paris! In Paris! <laughs> <laughs> I fear that hardly points to any serious state of mind at last. You will no doubt wish for me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manner in the wilderness can be adapted to any situation, joyful or, as in the present case, distressing. <sighs> I have preached it on harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation and festival days. The last time I performed it was at the cathedral as a charity sermon on behalf of the Society of the Prevention of Discontent Among the Upper Orders. 
The bishop who was present was most struck by some of the analogies I drew. Uh, that reminds me, Dr. Charleswell. You mentioned christenings, I think. I suppose you know how to christen all that. I mean, of course, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's more constant duties in this parish. I've often spoken to the poor classes on the subject, but they do not seem to know what thrift is. But is there any <laughs> particular infant you are interested? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. <laughs> oh, but this is a very <laughs> child, dear doctor. No, no. I'm very fond of children. Mm -hmm. No, the fact is, I'd like to be christened myself. This afternoon, if you had nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you've been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> but have you any grave doubts upon the subject? <clears throat> I certainly intend to have. Of course, I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way, or if, or if you think I'm too old. No, not at all. The sprinkling, sprinkling and indeed the immersion of adults is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? <laughs> you need no apprehension, Mr. Worthing. Sprinkling is all that was required, and indeed I think advisable. Whether it's so changeable. <clears throat> what time would you like the ceremony performed? Well, I might trot around about five if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. In fact, I have two similar ceremonies performed at that time. A case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor oh, Jenkins the Carter. I'm a hard working man. <laughs> I, oh, I don't see much fun being christened with other babies. It would be childish. Mm -hmm. No, it would have past five, do. Oh, admirably, admirably. And now, Mr. Worthing, I will no longer intrude into a house of sorrow. I merely beg you not to be too bowed down by grief. What seems to us as bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me to be a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. <gasps> oh, Jack! Oh, I am so pleased to see you have returned, but what horrid clothes have you got on? Go and change them. Cecily! My child, my child! <gasps> oh! What's the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you've got a toothache. And I've got such a surprise for you. Guess who's waiting for you in the dining room? Your brother! <laughs> <laughs> Your brother Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. Nonsense, I've got from. Don't say that. No matter how heartless he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out. Any blush I can to the emotion, will Jack? These are very joyous tidings. <laughs> <laughs> After we'd all been resigned to his death, his sudden return seems to me to be peculiarly distressing. My brother's still dying. I don't know what it all means. I think it's perfectly absurd. Good heavens! Brother John! <laughs> I've come all the way up from town just to tell you that I'm very sorry for all the trouble I've given you in the past, and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. <laughs> Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think he's coming here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Oh, Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes down to visit so often. <laughs> <laughs> and there must be some good in someone who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. He's been talking to you about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he's told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. <laughs> Bunbury. Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury about anything else. It's enough to drive him perfectly frantic. Well, of course, I admit that all the folks are on my side, but I must say that I find Brother John's coldness towards me peculiarly painful, especially considering this is the first time I've visited. Uncle Jack, if you do not shake hands with Ernest, I shall never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never! <laughs> well, this is the last time I shall ever do it.
You don't scout allowed. You mustn't have this place for what? I don't allow you bumbering here.
But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very much wicked and bad, you, of course, formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I, I say it was foolish of me, Ernest, but I fell in love with you. But, uh, but when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other, and after a long struggle with myself, accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name, which I promised you always to wear. Did I get you this? It is pretty, isn't it? <laughs> yes, you wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for your leading such a bad life. And here is the box which I keep all your dear letters. My letters? But, my own darling, I've never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week and sometimes oftener. <laughs> <laughs> My name was something else. But what? Oh, any name you like. Um, Algernon, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the name of Algernon. But I really shouldn't see why you should oppose the name of Algernon. It isn't a bad name at all. In fact, it's rather aristocratic. Half the chaps that get into bankruptcy court are named Algernon. <laughs> seriously, Cecily, if my name were Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you. Ernest, I might admire your character, but I fear I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. <clears throat> Cecily, your rector here is, I suppose, very well practiced in the rites and <laughs> ceremonies of the church. Oh, yes. Dr. Toswell is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. <laughs> I must see him at once on an important Christmas. I must see him at once on important business. Oh. I shan't be more than a half hour. Considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th, and I'm only leaving to you for the first time today, I think it rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period of half an hour. Do you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. <laughs> <laughs> what an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must enter his proposal into my diary. Cecily 
Cardio. Oh, Cecily Cardio, what a sweet name. I feel that we should be very great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after such a comparatively short time. Pray sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then it is all settled, is it not? I hope so. Perhaps this is a favourable opportunity to tell you who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You've never heard of Papa, I suppose. I don't think so. Outside the family circle, I'm glad to say Papa is almost entirely unknown. <laughs> that is quite as it should be. The home seems to me to be the proper sphere for the man. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes so painfully effeminate. And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. Hmm. Certainly. Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. So, do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I am very fond of being looked at. <laughs> <laughs> you are here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no. I live here. Really? Your mother, or some female relative of advanced years, resides here with you also? No, I have no mother, nor in fact any relations. Indeed. Yes, my guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh. Hmm. He never mentioned to me that he had a ward. I'm very secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. However, this news does not inspire feelings of unmixed delight. Mm -hmm. Cecily, I am very fond of you. I have liked you since I met you. But now that I know you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were, well, not quite so young as you appear to be, and <laughs> not quite so alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly, oh, I... Oh, please do. I think that whenever one has something unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well then, to speak with perfect candor, I wish you were fully 42 and more than unusually plain for your age. <laughs> Ernest has a strong, upright nature. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. However, even men of the strongest moral character are extremely susceptible to the physical charms of others. Modern realists and ancient history provides many most painful examples of what I currently refer to. Indeed, history would be unreadable if it did not. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest then mentioned to me that he had a brother. Yes, I am sorry to say they have not been on good terms for many years. Oh, well, that accounts for it. Now that I think about it, I have never heard any man mention his brother. It seems to be a subject to taste distasteful to most men. Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if a cloud had come over a friendship such as ours. <laughs> of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am to be his. I beg your pardon. Oh, um, dear Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the event next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. There seems to be some slight error. <coughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. You must be under some strange misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly half an hour ago. Well, this certainly is very curious, for he proposed to me <laughs> yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel anywhere without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read upon the train. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry. If it is any disappointment to you, dear Cecily, but I am afraid that I have the right claim. It would distress me more than I can say, dear Gwendolyn, if it should cause you any physical or mental anguish, but I feel bound to point out that since Ernest has posed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. <laughs> if a poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall regard it my duty to rescue him at once, and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglements my poor boy may have gotten into, I shall never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On occasions such as these, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. 
Do you, Miss Fairfax, just that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am happy to say that I have never seen a spade. It is obvious our social spheres have been widely different. <laughs> Shall I lay the tea here as usual, Miss? Yes, as usual. <laughs> Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardin? A great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardin. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. I don't know how anybody manages to exist in the country if anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Oh yes, that is what the newspapers are calling agricultural depression, is it not? I've heard the aristocracy are suffering from it a great deal as of late. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I've been told. Tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Testable girl, but I require tea. <laughs> Sugar? No, sugar is not fashionable anymore. Cake? Or bread and butter? Bread and butter. Cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays. And that's to Miss Fairfax! <laughs> Well, 
about then? <laughs> Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is very painful uh, because it is the first time in my life I've ever been reduced to such a painful position and I'm really quite an experience in doing anything of kind. <laughs> However, I'll tell you quite frankly that I have no brother Ernest. I have no brother at all. I never had a brother in my life, and I don't intend to have a brother in the future. No brother at all? None. Not, not even of any kind? No, not even of any kind. Then it appears that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl to find herself in, is it? Let us venture into the house. They will hardly, hardly dare to follow us there. No. Men are so cowardly, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> this, um, ghastly state of things is what you call bundering, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> and the most perfectly wonderful bunder it is, too. The most wonderful bunder I've ever had in my entire life. Well, you've no right whatsoever to bundery here. That's perfectly absurd. One has a right to bundery wherever one chooses. Every serious bunderist knows that. Serious bunderist? Look at this. Well, one must be serious about something if one is to find amusement in life. I happen to be serious about bunbury. What on earth you're serious about, I haven't the slightest idea. About everything, I should fancy. You've such an absolutely trivial nature. But the only small satisfaction I take in all of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. You'll be able to run down the country as often as you used to, dear boy, and a very good thing too. Your brother's looking a little off colour, isn't he, dear Jack? You won't be able to disappear to town quite so frequent frequently as your wicked custom was. And not a bad thing either. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I must say that you're taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like Cecily is quite inexcusable to say nothing of the fact that she's my ward. I can see no possible defence for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax, to say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to her, and that is all. I love her. Well, I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is certainly no chance of your marrying Miss Cardew. Well, I don't think it very likely, Jack, that you will be married to Miss Fairfax. This is no business of yours. If it was, I wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> Very vulgar to talk about one's own business. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and then only at dinner parties. <laughs> How you can sit there calmly eating muffins when we're in this horrible trouble, I can't make out. You see, we'd be perfectly harmless. Well, I can hardly eat muffins in an agitated manner. <laughs> <laughs> the butter would probably get in my cuffs. Besides, one should always eat muffins quite calmly. It's the only way to eat them. <laughs> I say it's perfectly hard that you're eating muffins at all under the circumstances. When I'm upset, food is the only thing that consoles me. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, when I'm very upset, as anyone who knows me intimately could tell you, I refuse everything. Except food and drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's no reason why you should eat them all in there. I wish you would have tea days. I don't like tea. Good heavens, I suppose a man made his own muffins in his own garden. You just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. I said it was perfectly heartless of you under the circumstances that it's a very different thing. That may be, but the muffins are the same. <laughs> Algernon, I wish to goodness you would go. I can't go, I haven't had dinner yet. I never go without dinner. Nobody ever does. Except for vegetarians and people like that. <laughs> Besides, I've made an appointment with Dr. Chaucer to be christened under the name of Ernest at quarter to six. My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I may have reached this morning that Dr. Chaucer will be christened myself at five thirty, and I naturally will take the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't both be christened, Ernest. It's absurd. Besides, I have a perfect right to be christened if I like. There's no evidence at all that I've ever been christened by anybody, and I should think it extremely probable I never have been. And so does Dr. Chaucer. This is entirely different. In your case, you've been christened already. Yes, but I haven't been christened in years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you've been christened. That is the important thing. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. If you're unsure about the subject, I must say I think it very dangerous you're venturing upon it now. It might make you very unwell. 
You could hardly have forgotten that somebody very closely connected with you was nearly car carried off with a severe chill in Paris this week. <laughs> <coughs> yes, but you said yourself a severe chill wasn't hereditary. It used to be, I know, but I dare say it is now. Science is always making wonderful improvements in things. <laughs> That's nonsense, Alton. You're always talking Jack, nonsense. you're at the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. You're <laughs> <laughs> only two left. <laughs> but I hate tea cake. Then why on earth do you allow tea cake to be served to your guests? What ideas of hospitality do you have? <coughs> Alton, I've already told you to go. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet. And there's still one muffin left. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they did not at once follow us into the house as anyone else would have done seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. They are eating muffins. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like repentance. <laughs> they don't seem to notice us. Couldn't you cough? I haven't got a cough. <laughs> oh, they're looking at us. What a frontery. They are approaching. That's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly, it is the only thing to do now. <laughs> this dignified sound seems to be producing a most unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one, and we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I have something particular to ask you, much depends upon your reply. Well, then your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity to meet you. That certainly seems like a satisfactory response. Yes, dear. <laughs> I can't. But that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. That is true. In matters of grave importance, it is style, not sincerity, that is the vital thing. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer for pretending to have a brother called Ernest? Was it that you might come to town as often as possible to see me? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. Now is not the time for German skepticism. <laughs> Their answers appear to be most satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. <laughs> I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief has said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. I had forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them the task is not a pleasant one? Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea! <laughs> I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time for me? <laughs> Certainly. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Our Christian names? Is that all? What we're going to be christened this afternoon? For my sake, are you prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me, you're willing to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How oh, absurd it is to talk of the equality of the sexes. When matters of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are far superior. We are. <laughs> They know moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. <laughs> Darling. Lady Bracknell. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing of the kind, sir. Now, as regards Algernon, Algernon, 
Yes, I'm going to Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl I've ever seen in my entire life. And I don't give two pence <coughs> about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. <laughs> my dear child, you must know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend on. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune to speak of, but I never dreamed of letting that get to my way. I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. You may kiss me now, Cecily. 
Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also dress me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. I suppose the wedding better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. <laughs> and to speak quite frankly, I am not myself in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out one's characters before marriage, which I think is never advisable. Uh, I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I'm Miss Carter's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age, and that consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, may I almost say, <coughs> ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing but looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew, but I don't approve at all of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. I feel there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house on the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I've just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brew 89. Why not especially reserving for myself? Continuing the course of his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently said to tea and devoured every single one. <laughs> what makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he knew from the first that I had no brother, that I never had a brother, that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so yesterday afternoon. Ahem, Mr. Worthy, after careful consideration, I have decided to completely overlook my nephew's conduct to you. <laughs> that is very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. However, my decision on the matter is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, sweet child. How old are you, dear? Eighteen, but I always submit to twenty at dinner parties. You are quite right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. Eighteen, but twenty at dinner parties. Well, it won't be long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. I therefore do not see why your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me for interrupting you again, Lady Grackle, but it is only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Carter does not come legally of age until she's, um, about 35. <laughs> that is not a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women who have by their own choice remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbledore is an instance in point. To my own knowledge, she has remained 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago. I do not see why Cecily will be any less pretty at the age mentioned than at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algy, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait that long. I hate waiting even five minutes for anything. It always makes me rather cross. I am not punctual, I know, but I do admire punctuality in others, and waiting even to be married is quite out of the question. Well, then what are we to do, Cecily? Mr. Worthy, as Miss Cecily states that she cannot pos possibly wait until she is 35, a remark which seems to me to display a somewhat impatient nature, I would beg you to reconsider your decision. But my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your hands. The moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will more than gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Well, then a passionate celibacy is all any of us can look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the life I propose for Gwendolyn. As for Algernon, he can choose for himself. Oh, come dear, we have not a moment to lose. We must find it not this train to miss any more party schools to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for all the christenings. The christenings? Is that not somewhat premature? Both, both these men have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. If Lord Bracknell were to learn that this was the way that you were wasting your time and money, he would be so displeased. Am I to understand there will be no things at all this afternoon? I don't think that as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us as possible. Sorry for some sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. <laughs> they were in the radical views of the Anabaptist views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished <laughs> sermons. However, as your present mood seems to be one of peculiar secular, I will turn to the church at once. <clears throat> Indeed. Just been warned by my pure 
little nervous about Miss Prism for the last hour in the house been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell, I'm on my way to join her. Pray, let me detain you for a moment. This is a matter of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent nature, remotely connected, connected to education? She's the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. This is most obviously the same person. <laughs> May I ask what position she holds in your household? I'm celibate, madam! <laughs> <laughs> I 
hate to seem inquisitive, but would you kindly inform me who I am? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that the news I have to tell you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Miss Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. <laughs> <laughs> So the last 40 years are here! He's a life form, I guess you would not have to. <laughs> 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 and generals, Malum, Moxbaum, Magley, ghastly names they have, <laughs> Mixby, Mobs, Moncrief! Moncrief, Lieutenant, 1940, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General, 1969, Christian names, Ernest John. <laughs> <laughs> I always told you my name was Ernest, didn't I? Well, it is Ernest. It naturally is Ernest. Uh, yes, now I remember that the general's name was Ernest. I knew I had a particular reason for disliking the name. <laughs> <laughs> Ernest, my own Ernest, I knew you should have no other name. Darling, this is a terrible thing for a man to find out that his whole life he's been telling nothing but the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can, for I feel sure you are to change. My own mother. Letitia! <laughs> Frederick, at <I'm> last! <laughs>